But all the all the all the reaction I'm getting, I'm throwing gasoline on it. I'm just like, you know, I'm so I'm talking that good smack. I started getting guys that are like on the main roster that didn't approve of it, or like, oh, like he's gonna be kicked out of the locker room. I'm talking shit. I'm talking smack, bro. Because you're playing that heel persona. So I go in the locker room, I drop my stuff, I go down and get my uh, hour of gym work and then two hours of ring training, and I go back up to shower, and I see all my stuff fanned out in the hall, and I'm like, no way. Hello, I'm your host Shane Mercer and welcome to Front Row Seat, part of the Millions Podcast Network. Remember to like, download, comment, subscribe and follow us on all the socials at frontrow.pod. My guest today is a former WWE star, an aspiring MMA fighter, a training coach and a recording artist. Joshua Bradle, a.k.a. Yeti, formerly known as Bronson Matthews. Thanks for joining me, Josh. How are you, man? Yeah, a pleasure to be here, bro. I'm doing good. How you doing, man? Hey, man, doing really well. Uh, really excited to have you on the show here. Who is Yeti and what is the Yeti hood? Uh, so I would say it's, it's an origin story. Uh, back when I was you know, younger, I was always like a, a larger individual. So when I was in high school, like one of those nickname things that the upperclassmen gave me, I was blessed to like play up in the varsity ranks right away and like some ways of the upperclassmen's way of dealing with that was like to call me yeti and at first i actually didn't really like it too much and then it started sticking and then it started becoming kind of like a tagline for like any sort of athletic advance or any athletic article and then it got headwind and then it's like i went to college as yeti and it just stuck and got embedded and then anything and everything else i did after that it was just uh, my nickname, bro. It was, it's kind of like, obviously, like, it's obvious, like a mythical creature, you know what I'm saying? It's like an Appalachian Bigfoot, you know? It's kind of how I move, too. I keep it sleek. I keep it discreet. I, I kind of keep my business to myself until I pop out. And it's just been like the persona that I just kept rolling with, bro. Tell me, how big are you exactly? I'm um, like 6'7 and some change. I'm um, like, right now I'm sitting at like 265, 269. Oh, wow. Definitely in in the heavyweight category. And being Absolutely. a big guy with the name Yeti, it only makes sense that you're from a place like Colorado in the mountains. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I grew <laughs> up in Denver and Thornton, Mile High City. Shout out. That's my hometown, bro. Talk to me about growing up in, uh, in, in Thornton, Colorado. It's what, like a small city, right? Yeah, it's a small city. It's just north of Denver. Uh, it's, it's easy to get to Denver from. The atmosphere and the, the geographical location definitely like hardens you as a kid more than you know until you get older and look back in retrospect. But it was a good time, man. We, uh, my sports were like 5A, a good, decent competition, a good like uh, scope at what could be. You know what I'm saying? If you if you rise through the ranks and like have a good career out here, you're kind of like seeded to do decent elsewhere. I would say personally that like, and probably still to this day, even with the advancement of social media and everything, like recruiting out of Colorado is subpar. There's like some sort of like some sort of cloak around us that doesn't really let us be seen by all eyes unless like you're really doing profound things, which is like, okay. But uh, growing up with Denver, growing up with Thornton, there was a blessing that like shaped me to be who I am. You know, you you played a lot of sports and being such a big guy, you know, basketball was going to come naturally, football. Uh, you know, what were you into first as a kid? I would say basketball is my first love. Growing up, like, I was always, like, a thicker individual. Like, when I was in fifth grade, I was more like the five-by-five five kind of guy. I was thick, bro. I was kind of getting ready to sprout up. I was growing just as wide as I was tall to prep for my foundation. In middle school, I, like, fell in love with basketball so much that I basically forgot to eat. So I lost probably, like, 30, 40 pounds. I kept my big man leg strength, and then I started soaring. In high school, then, you played basketball and you played football? Yeah, so like my freshman year of high school, I didn't even play football. I was, I was all basketball. It shows up. I was like, I'm doing this basketball thing. And then we had an injury. Our tight end went down, and I had our coach had asked me to play. So I started playing kind of later in the season. And like my first play as a tight end, I caught like a 55-yard touchdown. It was a corner out. It was on Denver East at Five Star Stadium. Shout out Denver East. Yeah, it was cool, man. It was like at, at that point, I was like, all right, I think I like this. And then I started getting recruited. And then through like a, a very cool perspective of recruitment, I was getting all the letters, all the shiny stuff from all the big schools. I was really thinking about Oregon and Boise and then CU offered me. And that was like my biggest like moment of like, oh, hell yeah, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm getting offered by my like hometown. I'm going to go see you just like I wanted. And like, here we go. So I verbally committed. And then that was like when I came up with my first like major like heartbreak adversity. My senior year, I tore my shoulder up pretty bad. 
and I was kind of like trying to like not play and recover. And this is when I already had like an official offer and I officially accepted, but I didn't like sign nothing yet. So I missed a couple games and it, it, it basically got to a point where they told me like, we're not trying to invest in damaged goods once they found out my shoulder situation. So I kind of had to do something that was very humbling for me and like very like saddening at the time because I wanted, I wanted something that I had so bad. So then the D2 spectrum started coming to recruit me. And it was like, man, like these schools are like low budget. It's not as flashy or shiny. It was like a good moment for me. And at the time it was painful and weird and like saddening, but it was also like a good time for me to like start realizing what mattered and like it's all on me either which way, right? So I ended up getting recruited by the D2 level and I went to this school called CSU Pueblo. It was the second year back in resurrection as a football team. It used to be called USC, University of Southern Colorado. So I got, I got down the team and it was just a bunch of guys like me, just some like D1 guys that fell through the system and like had a chip on our shoulder and we were all like meant to be playing D1. So we, we like rallied and then by my senior year, we won a national championship. We were killing, killing it. A lot of us went pro, a lot of us went pro, bro. Some of us stood out there, shout out Morgan Fox, shout out Ryan Jensen, Mike Pinnell, Darius, you know, all the boys, that, there's some boys out there playing, grinding years and years later. It was just like a thing where, uh, it was a humbling character builder because you, you, you compare the D2 level to the D1 level, like it's half, like half the funding, half the scholarships, half the love, half of the like payoff really. So to overcome the odds and then get seen and get recruited by the next level NFL is even that much harder. So you got to have a winning record. You got to have other sickos on your team. You got to have a coach that somewhat helps you get recruited because a lot of these coaches, they don't even realize they're blo- like they're trying to do something for the team so much that they're really blocking individual guys going up. It's like a very like fine line balance, right? So luckily we started breaking the seal ourselves and put, kind of putting Pueblo on the map. And like I said, by my senior year, we won a national championship. So it was kind of one of those things where it was like worst case scenario turned into best case scenario. And then uh, through my career at CSU Pueblo, I started off as a tight end, which carried from high school. And then um, I went through more adversity before we won the national championship, I actually like, I tore my, I studied kinesiology exercise science, which was a huge blessing because that was kind of one of the things, a lot of, a lot of these players, all these college athletes, you have kind of a plan or you have like a umbrella you want to fall under. And a lot of times it's comfy to like go to an umbrella that's still very close to athletics because you, you are athletics. Like you love sports, you love your sports. So you want to stay near it, even if you're done playing the game and you can't even really fathom what that feels like yet, but you're trying to like prep for it if you're responsible. So I was like, all right, I want to stay in the athletic realm. So I started studying kinesiology, exercise science, just kind of like throwing like a dart at the dartboard, right? And through that, it was beautiful because I played tight end for two years and then I switched to defensive end, like three tech DN. And I was kind of a mauler, like right away. It was like I got to think less and like go harder. So all the all the plays and the coverage that I was reading, I got to kind of just hone that in and just go destroy and go kill, right? So it was like a fun time for me to transform Boom, I tear my ACL in the off season in the spring ball. Oh. And then I find out that I'm going to have my daughter, Nayeli, with a torn ass ACL, not even knowing if I'm going to come back, not even know if I'm going to play again. And I'm feeling this is my first major injury, so I'm like even more dainty on it. Like my mental, like my body's trying to protect me from furthering the injury. So you're guarding even heavier. So things seem even more intense than they are. I got the surgery. I have my daughter, unplanned, obviously. And those were just two more humbling moments that like really excelled me to uh, more greatness, right? Because it made me tighten my game up. It made me really decide like what what mattered to me and like how I was going to get it. It was a blessing because I started really understanding and learning the girth of my major in exercise science and kinesiology. And I was able to kind of translate these key items to myself in the recovery and the rehab. So next thing you know, five months pass of rehab. And I'm faster, stronger than I was ever before. And I'm looking good too, because I'm like starting to translate these like scientific facts into my life and like see the cause and effects up front. So it's pretty cool. And with that came another blessing. I kind of was televising that on Instagram. This is kind of when Instagram first started popping off and the fitness realm of Instagram was like very propagated and lush. And so I started, um, people were asking me for advice, fitness advice, and I was kind of giving out free smoke in the DMs, right? And then pretty soon I was like, yo, I got it. Like, I got to like make a little change off of this somehow. So everybody at the time was calling me Thor, Thor this, <laughs> Thor that on social media. I can see the resemblance. So I came up with this idea to like, thank you. I came up with this idea to like make a, a fitness plan called 40 days, 30 days, a dollar a day. 
and uh, I made like a female version, a male version, one with the mindset of gaining weight and losing weight for both genders. And it just hit, bro. And I started doing pre-orders for the next month. And then the next thing you know, I was making a little bit of money on top of it. So I'm like, oh, this is cool. I'm giving out and I'm doing this new thing. But I'm like, I want to play football. So I get released at five months. I come back. I'm getting into my groove again. And then all of a sudden, at one of our walkthroughs before a game, I, like, run back, run past the quarterback, like, slap him on the hip to, like, pantomime that I would have got the sack because like, we take care of each other, like, in the, in the preparation for the game. And I shuffle my feet and pivot to, like, run back to the huddle. And God just, like, sniped my ACL again. Boom, I fall to the ground. Everyone, like, field went silent. I'm like, I can't even believe it. I, like, try to move my foot, and I feel that the instability's back. And I'm like, damn, bro. Like, within seconds, my knee's already swollen again. Tore my ACL again, bro. I had a lot of support around me, but I was like, that's when I really plummeted, right? Lost all kinds of weight just because I was in, like, a true depression. It was, like, my first, like, true. And I had my daughter, like, almost here. The timing was just awful, right? I kind of had this newfound like love for the game. I just got it out the mud again because I just came back from ground zero, and boom, I'm back at ground zero. So now I'm like, all right, I got time on my side, so I red shirt, a medical red shirt. I take a whole year off, and then uh, coincidentally, like right after I get my second ACL surgery, my daughter's born, and I'm just like downloading everything I am and know to her, and I'm getting to spend a good amount of time with her during the day. Obviously, I'm still going to class, and I'm actually bringing her to some classes with me. I'm rehabbing with the same mindset, but just with a longer uh, goal set. And my coach, John Riston, he was very, like, accommodating and helpful and supportive. And my team and, like, uh, Co Coach Paul Creighton, my defensive line coach at the time, he was always – like, I had Nile in the meeting room with me changing her diapers. She was very docile, very, like, intelligent girl right away, partially because of, like, who her daddy is, but also because she's just, like, special herself. She, she was in, like, class with me. She was learning how to, like – articulate and go through these motions at like a professional or collegiate level. So that was kind of her baseline for knowledge. So again, all this adversity like came out like beautiful shining lights, right? So I just had to like stick with it. And then from that moment, got some more momentum again. We started doing good, started winning. We uh, make it to the uh, national championship. So that's three major injuries before getting to that championship then. Two surgeries. So two ACL reconstructions. Those are moments where as an athlete, you know, like you, you have a lot of pride in who you are, but then you also have like this standard for yourself that you set because you do all this work for X amount of years. So like you have like benchmark points and like when you tear your ACL, depending on what your position is and who you are as a person, like you just fall through all those benchmarks and you like remember them, see them and then on your way back, you're like, man, this ain't it yet. And it takes time and like persistence, but doing that twice over, kind of created this new type of animal inside of me that was like, all right, like there's going to be moments where you want to like quit or like fail. For me, it was just kind of like an antidote that allowed me to like reflect that into the future because we'll talk about it. I had more and more adversity come, right? So this is all before you're, you're done college, right? Yeah. So this is like, this is by, by the time I'm done with college, I already had all this under my belt. So, yeah. so I basically get to the point where we win the natty. And again, it's a D Division II national championship. So it's still, like, amazing, but it's very uh, less than you would imagine in terms of, like, the post-party. Not, not like, drinking beers party, like, the post-celebration as a team and as an organization, as a school. All that was, like, pretty light. You know what I mean? It was, like, kind of like we won, got the school a huge check, a, a whole bunch of opportunity. And then if you don't have class next semester, it's like, see ya. So, like, now it's like, all right, with the odds – against me really because if you're a d2 guy trying to go pro you might have some eyes on you but might have some calls you have a lot of faith to put in your agent right like whereas my agent uh wow that was a, that was an experience too that's an adversity I, I had some friends that had the same agent he was kind of a guy that was more of like a quantity guy over a quality guy you might say he had a okay. he was signing a ton of athletes so he had a huge huge wheelhouse of athletes with all with potential but he wasn't really giving us all the love and the and the effort and the mindset that you should, because A, there were so many of us, and B, this was kind of his style. It came down to a point where I was lucky, like uh, I got invited to, when the draft came out in the seventh round, it was like pretty clear that the Broncos and uh, the Eagles were like gonna take a D lineman. I had worked out with the Broncos. I went to the regional combine and really set myself out. So it was like some moments where it seemed like the odds were against me to the utmost, but I just kept putting in the work I was prepping with the best for the league. And then I went to the regional combine, which was here in Denver, Colorado. 
killed it. I got invited to the Super Regional Combine. I was there with a lot of guys that have been out of the NFL. I'm trying to get back in. Did very well, too. And at this point, it's kind of on the fence. Like, all right, I'm a three-tech. I'm about, like, 280, 285. But they're kind of wanting me to play O-line, which is, like, scary because I, I haven't played that ever. And at the pro level, it's a whole different beast anyway. I'm kind of gaining more and more weight. I'm basically, like, 295 at the, the Super Regional Combine. And uh, I ran some good numbers. I still showed, like, my athletic ability. I, I performed well. So then the, the draft comes. Seventh round comes, I'm waiting, I'm seeing him, boom, passes me, boom, drafts over, I'm still, I haven't gotten a call, I'm tripping, I'm trying to call my agent, this guy's not calling me back, uh, I started hearing from some of my buddies that have the same agent, they're like, they haven't even got nothing, some of these guys are better athletes than me, belong in the NFL, they had, they didn't even get a try, all of a sudden I get a call, it's Green Bay Packers, they're like, hey man, we want to have you come out, blah, 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 I'm like, what, so I call him to let him know, he's like, oh, congrats, I'm like, what the hell's going on, so, that moment, I'm just like, I'm just sending it. So I get out there, start working hard. This is like after like maybe a week and a half of being there. They asked me to come in and bring my black iPad, my playbook. So I'm like thinking, oh man, I'm cut. This is crazy. Like, Ugh, that, that was the sign. Yeah, so I go in, I bring my playbook. We talk a little bit. They take it and then they give me a white iPad. And they're like, all right, we want to try you at a line, right tackle. Like start, you better dive into this playbook and figure it out. And I'm like, I feel blessed with the second opportunity, but also I'm like, nervous because like that's like me telling you hey bro like this podcast is cool but i need you to go uh be a dentist real quick and do this root canal <laughs> cool with that. like honestly honestly and you're like here's, here's the instruction manual go knock that out real quick i appreciate it and you're a dentist now so like but that's it <laughs> so, you know what i'm saying it doesn't, doesn't really translate like maybe you'll go try and maybe you know maybe you'll get it done but like chances are that patient's gonna be in a world of hurt you know what i'm saying so yeah. so that's kind of how it went down then i was there for a little bit longer uh, I gained some more weight. They were gaining, they were putting weight on me quick. I was like following this like sticker system uh, when I was in the cafe. It was like I followed like this, these purple stickers. They had me like gaining weight quick. So basically, when I got released, I was like a slick like three thirty five, three forty. I get home, mind you, my daughter's at home waiting for me. Uh, her mom was waiting for me, which is my uh, my ex, and it's like this like weird like I'm trying to be normal and be cool for them. But I have this like huge like weight on me, like of failure, disappointment, emptiness, like cluelessness. You know what I'm saying? What am I gonna do nextness? So I'm like, all, right, all I can do for sure is that get back to like healthy weight, make sure like I'm okay, and then just start seeing what's next. So I hop in the gym, I'm just grinding. I'm like even on the stair stair step, or I'm on the stair mill, and that's not my style because I'm just trying to get this weight off me, right? And it, it was a, to get to this weight, it was a chore. I was eating like all the food you could imagine and shakes all day it was insane so wow and to, to get to what you said 330 yeah yeah like my, my heaviest weight ever was 340 but yeah i was wow. like floating like 330 if i if i missed like one meal i would like lose 10 20 pounds it was like insane like it was water weight it was inflammation it was very unhealthy i would get out of bed in the morning and if i didn't kind of like get a nice little warm-up with my ankles and feet i felt like i was gonna blow my foot out so honestly so uh i'm losing the weight i'm losing the weight and then all of a sudden, uh, I'm starting to feel momentum slip from me, man. So I'm like, oh, I got to do something. So I kind of just start like hitting this style of like reaching out networking that I know on Instagram and just trying to use that platform to kind of help finesse and like propagate and plant seeds. Right. And as that's going, it's like, it's nothing. I get this like very like catfish esque email. And like at that point I was getting a lot of like good, at, like good nothing emails, some like scammer type emails and some catfish emails. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of how it was like, right? And so I see this catfish-esque email and it's basically saying like, yo, Skype us for a trial with the WWE. And it, the whole email is like typed up pretty, pretty shady, weird. But then like the footer, the signature and the information and the number, it all seemed real proper. And I was scorned and jaded at the time. So I was kind of like, yeah, whatever, boom, delete it. Cause hey, like what's Skype, bro? Skype, Skype to me is a red flag. I don't Skype. I never Skype. <laughs> so I was like, all right. So then now two more weeks go by. I'm like down to like 310, 308 sometimes, 312 most of the time. I'm like, man, this ain't falling off for nothing. I'm working hard. I'm like, what can I do? I gotta like, I need to do something like this week. Like someone's gotta hit at least like to start this whole thing off. I go back into the into the email. I find I go to my deleted. I go to the trash and I undelete that email that I said was catfish. I reply, I'm like, I'm like, hey, I'm not Skyping nobody, but I'll either FaceTime or call somebody, like no problem, just let me know. Uh, I got a little bit of time today and tomorrow. 
they hit me back like what while I'm at the gym still, like maybe 15 minutes later. They're like, oh, perfect timing. If you could FaceTime us at this number in the next 20 minutes, that would be great. So I'm like, weird. Like, I was like thinking about calling someone for some like advice or just to kind of like share like the experience with them. Yeah, that's really fast too, right? Like, fast. you know, like, oh, FaceTime us right now. It almost <laughs> felt like, oh, I was right. This is like fake. This is like some catfish type of situation. Yeah. And as that's happening, I'm like, well, I'm at the gym. Let me just do it here. And there's like a lot of people in the gym. I was like, oh, I don't want to like have this traffic. I'm going to go outside. So I go out to the back of this gym and there's like beautiful mountains in the background, right? So I'm like, oh, that's a nice back. Like, honestly, I wish that was behind you right now. And so there's like a exposed brick on the wall, like the bricks coming out a little bit out of the mortar. So I was like, oh, this is like a perfect like phone stand. Bah, I put my phone on there. I call him and I'm thick right now. And on my IG, I'm shredded. I'm looking nice. But at that time, I'm thick. But I just have like a fresh pump. So for here up, I look solid, right? So, <laughs> so I call him, boom, boom, boom. And then uh, they answer and it's like Triple H and two casting directors. Like if you don't know who Triple H is, he's like a legend in the game of wrestling and WWE. So it's him. And, I, I know who Triple yeah, H is. Yeah, so yeah. It's, him, it's him and two casting directors. And like, that's crazy. Crazy. There's no way you were expecting Triple H to be on the other end of this FaceTime call. Yeah, no way. Like, without a doubt. Like, I saw WWE. I thought there might be like something down the road. That's the hope. That's the hopeful purpose of this call. Boom, out the gate. Triple H, two casting directors. So now I kind of start whipping it. I start showing my charisma and like talking to them. I make them laugh a couple of times. Say say my whole rundown. And like, they're just asking me questions. Like, oh, well, we like you. Uh, we're going to send you some flight information to your email. We're going to fly you out to Florida, to Orlando. We're going to have this tryout at the uh, Performance Center. It's, uh, like, near Full Sail University off, like, Forsyth in Orlando. It's going to be a three-day tryout. Like, we wish you the best. We hope, like, we hope you're everything you say you are. And I'm like, oh, yeah, like, I'm going to come get that. No cap. So I get off the phone, and I'm like, Shh. I tell I tell my family at the time, like, Yo, I'm about to go do this. And it's kind of like this weird, like, almost like a hangover effect where it's like, oh, you're like, really? You're like, you're leaving? It was like almost this, like, doubtful energy that I got from my ex. It was like one of those moments where, like, I think probably in life, anyone else has gone through that, they might fold or they might be like, yeah, you're right. Like, I'm just going to, like, do what's smart or, like, like smart, like, whatever that is, right? Which is, like, this mm-hmm. construct that's, like, kind of, like, just let off the gas because you don't want to run out of gas type of thing. Like, nah. So I was like, I'm going. So I go down there. Right away, I didn't have a lot of experience in, any, in things like this, but I could just tell from my inside, this is like low budget, but like also, because we're, we're, they're feeding us like chewy bars, like they're feeding us weird stuff, right? Like there's no solid meals. There's a lot of people here. And every day people are quitting. They're trying to make the week exposed for the camera, but also just to get them out of there. So every day people are quitting, quitting. And basically the performance center is like a beautiful little center that the WWE has where it's like, if you're on the main roster and you're big time, big time, it's somewhere you go to kind of light practice, watch some film, talk to some people, catch a shower, get a lift in. And there's like three rings in there as well. So, but for us, they're using the three rings as like this cardio, like death cycle, where it was like, there was a movement in each ring. And then once you're done, you had to slide out, run to the next ring, slide in, keep it going. So they're just doing this like melting pot of just trying to whittle out the week. And it was working. It was cool and fun to see they're filming it. And then it gets down to the third day, and they're like, all right, we're going to announce the final 13. And, like, most people quit before they even told them to go home, right? Because it was hard. It was just one of those things where it's like if you've taken yourself to that level before, like, if you've, been, if you've played college sports and you've been through an off season, you could handle this. But it's still going to, like, test you. And for me, I had this, like, very, like, optimistic, positive mindset because I was like, either way, which way this goes, this is like a mini fat camp for me. I'm trying to get out of there under 300, you know what I mean? So I'm just going in, and I'm just, like, going to go hard. So I went in there. I went hard. I like let them know what it was, and then I made the final 13. So next thing you know, I'm, they're like, "Congrats, final 13! You're gonna be on uh, ABC season six, Tough Enough. It's a reality TV show where it's an elimination style. This is actually the first of its kind this season. This is the sixth season, and it's gonna be live voting to keep you or, or send you home at the end of each episode. And I'm like, "What the hell? This is awesome!" So they start kind of like interviewing us a little bit more. They give us like a stipend check to get some more clothing. And I'm like, yo, I'm going to send a stipend check back home. And I'm just going to go home and get my clothes and bring them back because I need the money right now. I'm just going to give this to the fam. And they're like, oh, no, you can't go home. Like we start we start filming media the next three days and then we start the show in three days. I was like, what? I was like, you better tell my baby mom's that. She's going to be pissed. And she was. <laughs> so then there's some more adversity. Like the fine lining, I mean, like it's just the facts. Like I was going through it every which way. Like it was just kind of like this like big 
big, big, big deep breath I took, and I was holding it, bro, for years. And I was just like, oh, I got to stay poised, stay poised. So now, now I'm still there with, like, my daughter at home who I miss like crazy, and she's missing me. And then, like, my support system ain't supporting me really, but I'm like, I, I'm like, I got to get this. And I'm kind of doing this. At, at the time, I was like, am I just trying to, like, prove myself to myself? Or I was like, nah, like, I'm on the path, bro. Let's get it. They get us into this warehouse, bro. And the warehouse is actually connected to the PC, which I was referencing earlier. And like the, yeah. the warehouse is like 20 foot, 24 foot ceilings. And then they stage out a reality TV show house that they, they make it almost like, like a lab rat experiment. There's no ceiling, right? So from a bird's eye view, you can see all the rooms. And like after like eight feet tall, there's no ceiling, but they shoot the, they shoot everything. So it looks like you're in the house. Oh yeah. Okay. I see what you mean. There's no, nothing like to sort of make it seem like there's a ceiling so they can shoot down into the rooms, however they need exactly. to. Exactly. Or when they're in the room shooting, they just make sure the angles to where like the, the wall cuts off to perceivably there's, mm-hmm. there's a ceiling. So it's hot, bro. It's Florida. I don't even, I don't know what month it was, but God dang, it's hot and humid. So there's no AC. It takes four days of living there for them to like, rise one garage get some like particle board to patch that rise garage and like cut some holes in it they get this diesel air conditioning unit and they're just pumping in diesel ac for the next 16 weeks to keep us alive no ac in florida just sounds crazy you know, to me. when i say low budget bro that they got to the point where like so for the kitchen there was no like permit for a gas line or for like any like kitchen stuff so we had one of those like fridges that your mom gets you for college like a tiny one and like a microwave and then i bought a water boiler and then uh, like week six i can or maybe it's like week four i convinced them to get a gas grill a propane gas grill to like be in the back so that we could cook so it was like not in the property and they obliged and boom so now we're going and like like i said so at the first beginning of the show i wasn't too confident i wasn't too loud I, i was confident but i was just like i already had a kid i wasn't like these people I was kind of letting them kill them to themselves off, but it was risky because I was kind of like quiet in the background. So I got called out and then I got put in the bottom three right away. I didn't get voted off. And then the mixture of just me being who I am and then like losing my weight exponentially because this was also like, this became like a long-term fat camp for me, really. That's how I saw it. Because I had already trained all these people in college, had all these results for, through 31 days. I had a special treatment plan. I had four clients that lost over 100 pounds with me that are still friends to my day, all super successful in LA and in their own lives. I'm like, all right, I know the I know the game plan. I know the formula. I just got to do it to myself. And I'm in this perfect environment with like zero excess and zero like temptation in terms of dieting. And I'm there locked down Monday through Friday and they bring me like if you have enough like, responsibility to write out a grocery list on Mondays on Tuesday they bring the the groceries so I was the only one I'm like asparagus salmon white rice <laughs> oatmeal and that's pretty much it bro I was just repeating that repeating all the good that. stuff go all the way to the final winning along the way I had some other connections that led to some more seeds to be sprouted in the future right so I, I get I get to the end of the show Win the show, I win a one-year contract with the WWE and a quarter million dollars. And they turn my one-year contract into a four-year contract. I play this game of life. I shuffle my family out there. I come up on some experiences that are lessons. My family splits. My daughter and baby mama are gone for, like, mad long. That's trauma and turbulence. I'm sticking with it. I'm, like, making trips to see my daughter. Daughter's making trips to see me. There's like some situations in the, in the WWE that if you're new to that scene, uh, they have like their own culture that's very like rich and like dialed in. And part of that culture, if you aren't from it, they'll try you through like, they'll basically be putting out uh, traps, mouse traps or like banana peels out. And if you do, you slip up, that's when you know about it, right? So, so I, was, I was learning about what I was learning about in the WWE. It was kind of like this viscous, ecosystem for me because like i got into it through the show classically tough enough winners don't last long they like really come for your head which i was a little different it was it was a beautiful experience bro i was in the wwe for like four years i was living in orlando once that came to an end i was like i know in my heart right now at that age i was like there's really no one in this industry the way it's going right now that i really want to like become like truly like there's a lot of guys I look up to. I would say there's a handful of guys in that industry I look up to and like want to be like. But at that moment, I was like, that was my logic. It was like, right now, in my wheelhouse, in my ecosystem, and who's influencing me and I have like pull with, 
none of these guys really on my side and none of them I really want to be like. So like, I've been here before, like I've had things taken away from me. I'm just going to like set myself up to like retire. I had gotten a very minimal concussion that was witnessed and I like bled from my head. So like it was a protocol type thing. And when I got this concussion, they like, they shelved me hard and it was like, how did you get it? We, there's a, there's a bunch of cardio drills that you can do. There's like this one up and over drill. Say you and me are doing the drill and, and we lock up in the center of the ring and I take you by the back of the neck and I throw you at the turnbuckle and you, you stumble at the turnbuckle. And my intention of that was to throw you in the turnbuckle and then like tackle you in the back so that you, uh, you know what I'm saying? But as oh, I, yeah. but, I've seen this before, but as I get to you, <laughs> as I get to you to go tackle you, you outwit me and you jump and you grab the corners of the turnbuckle. Oh yeah. You okay. Throw your legs up and I go under you and then you run that way. And now we repeat yeah. almost like suicides, but wrestling style. So I'm doing that. Okay. So you're practicing this technique. Yeah. yeah. So I'm doing this drill. It's, it's actually just a cardio drill at this point. And this guy named Caesar, I was doing it with him. He's a great guy. He's still in the biz. He's killing it. He, kind of double clutches and doesn't really get up because we're exhausted. So we kind of like can't get up. So I kind of like analyze that. He, then he double clutches, like I said, and then his heel, bow. And so I'm like, oh, so we finished the drill. And as like I'm finishing, I started seeing blood drops on the floor. And he opened me up a little bit. And I had like a nice goose egg hematoma, right? Mm. And they're like, oh, you might have a concussion. Normally I might be like, nah, I don't have a concussion. And I was like, all right, well, then what do you think? So then I just went through their system. Next thing their system like put me on the shelf heavy and it was obvious. So I kind of stayed on the shelf and I was just like focusing on like checking my boxes that I needed to check with work and just being a good dad. And then I started noticing like I needed to just move, bro. So I just made the, made the decision. One day I like called U-Haul and I was like, hey, how much would it take to move like two and a half rooms to Colorado? Like what size truck would I need? And they told me. I was like, all right, cool. And can I reserve that? They're like, oh, tomorrow. I was like, bet, reserve it. And then I like called two men. Two men in a truck moving service. I was like, hey, yo, I got a situation. I'm not really trying to hire you guys to move my things. I just, I'm just i trying to hire you guys to like professionally pack a truck for me because I got to drive across the country. Is that like an option? They're like, oh, not really, but like if we charge you this, we'll do it. And I was like, all right, cool. So boom, start packing. Next morning, I pick up the truck. These guys show up, help me pack, help me Tetris pack the truck. I drive all the way home, bro. Like basically kind of re- hard reset again. I get out of that. I'm just in Colorado. I'm just doing like more of like a blue collar street mindset. I kind of got some of my money tied up into like a framing company just to turn money over for a little while. I was like, man, here we are again. Like this has been like a race to this moment. I'm kind of like falling out again. I like I can't give up. I got to keep it going. So so let me get a sense of where we're at here in terms of like time. So how old are you at at this point? At this point, it's like uh, I'm probably twenty. Five, twenty five, twenty six, and you had spent four years in the WWE already. Yeah, yeah. Wow, and, you know, four years in the WWE is still a fair amount of time. I mean, there must have been some fun there too, right? And you know, the fan experience. Oh yeah, there was a lot of fun and a lot of support. Fans liked me from the jump from the show. The show was like a nice uh, additive to like who I was, and it was why I was in there. I still get love to this day. I'll go to the store. Not expecting nothing, and I'll see like, oh, Yeti from Tough Enough. Like, oh, no. I'm like, wow, that's crazy, bro. Like, really stuck with people. And you wrestled as Bronson Matthews, not not Yeti, right? Yeah, yeah. So like, at first, I was wrestling as Yeti, and then I wrestled a couple, a little bit like in-house matches is just my my normal name. And then one day, this guy named Matt Bloom, uh, he came up to me and was like, hey, yo, uh, Hunter has got a name for you finally. Hunter's Triple H, and I was like, oh yeah. He shows me it's like Bronson Matthews. And it was kind of, I think, I didn't know this for sure, but there was a challenge when I was on the show and we had to pick a paper out of a bowl and there was a name in a genre of a character and you had to portray that character for a promo. And so mine was like Bronson, the British brawler. So I had to be like a British guy and like be Bronson. So then that kind of echoed forward and I think that was just kind of like the know-how behind that. But yeah, I mean, like, I don't mean to get negative with WWE. It was just, like, I would say overall as, like, who I became as a person, there was a lot of adversity within that. That, like, when I when I look back, that's, like, what which could sound negative is more like the positives that came out of it. There was a lot of fun, though, too, man. Like, I had a, I have some good friends, some lifelong friends I met in there. We're all over the world now because they, they do a great job of recruiting from all walks of life. Yeah, so I, I wrestled as Bronson Matthews, though. That was, like... 
actually when most of my trouble started was because they were like, all right, you're Bronson Matthews. We want you to be a heel, which is a bad guy. Baby face is a good guy. Heel's a bad guy. So like, I was like, they gave me the thumbs up to be a heel. And I'm, I'm cool with being a heel. I'm kind of good at being a heel anyway. So I'm like, all right. So I started talking smack to everybody. I'm like in it to win it on that, on that front. Got me into a lot of Twitter beef. Uh, one instant in particular it was pretty hilarious there's like this situation where some of these guys that have been working real hard for a couple of years to like get up through the ranks however which way they formed a faction together faction is like a little brotherhood like a small team a clique if you will and they were called the social outcasts so i'm at home just like i am right now uh watching monday night raw and i'm in the business but i'm like clocked in while i'm clocked out basically so i'm watching and the, the social outcasts come out and they introduce themselves and they kind of give this like YMCA-esque premise, like not each one of them different than the other. They have that same energy. They're like, Oh, we're, we're the social outcasts and I'm blasey blah. blah. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's kind of like, to me, to, to be honest, I was kind of like, Hmm, like, all right. And then, so they get in, they keep, they keep on their charisma. They keep trying to sell themselves. Boom. All of a sudden the big shows music hits. He doesn't like it. He comes out. Some of them are so excited. They don't, they don't notice. So Big Show comes out, one shots all of them, oh, knocks them all out. So like in the, in the business, it's called a squash match. So like they squashed him, right? Okay. And so I, I had this, I had this like a series of catchphrases, but one of Bronson's like things was like being like arrogant and cocky. And I would say like, yup, I like it. Like even if I obviously didn't like it or if it was like something, a crass situation where I shouldn't like it, I would still say I like it. So I literally on Twitter put, yup, I like it return return and then hashtag their name is social outcast i put social jobbers so so jobber is a term that's like backstage only and it literally refers to someone who's like uh loses all the time to like make other people look better so like if you job out if you if you meet at a match and, and i beat you up and it's like obvious you're losing real real bad some people backstage might say like that match you jobbed out or you're a jobber but you don't really right. say that in the public eye and so my perception as a new WWE superstar that just learned this phrase and when I heard that phrase in context most of the time it was like almost used like the word rookie right and so now I use this in my context so I say yup I like it return return hashtag social jobbers instead of social outcasts boom it trends it gets all this trash people like oh my god career suicide he's using insider terms on the internet Da, da, da. All of a sudden, some of the guys from the main show. You didn't know that you shouldn't be using. Yeah, yeah, this. I truly did not. This, this was literally this was literally a byproduct of like them teaching me jobber through a specific vector. You know, so it's like, but I'm a heel now, so I'm at home. All the all the all the reaction I'm getting, I'm throwing gasoline on it. I'm just like, you know, I'm so I'm talking that good smack. I started getting guys that are like on the main roster that didn't approve of it. Are like, oh, like he's gonna be kicked out of the locker room. I'm talking shit. I'm talking smack, bro. Because you're playing that heel persona. Yes. So so now I'm like, all right, like I killed it tonight. I go to bed like, hell yeah, I killed that. I wake up in the morning, I go to the PC, I get there, and that guy I referred to earlier, Matt Bloom, he's like basically like my boss in that situation. At that, at that point in time, the way that they had NXT and the WWE set up, it was like my hierarchy was like me, Matt Bloom, Triple H, and then Vince for the most part. Actually, before that, it was uh, Billy Gunn. And when Billy Gunn uh, got out of there... That was my demise, really, because he had my back. Shout out to Billy Gunn. He's in the AEW now, killing it, though. I show up to the PC the next day, and Matt Bloom comes up to me. He's like, what was up with that last night? Were you drunk? What's like, what, what was that for? And I was like, drunk? I was like, nah, I ain't drinking right now. Like, what do you mean? And he's like, that, I'm like, that you messed up, man. You shouldn't have done that. And I'm, I'm, ser- I'm like genuinely clueless. Like, what do you mean, bro? Like, I'm out here, like, trying to, like, make something pop from nothing. And I did. Like, they're not talking about, like, Monday Night Raw, they're talking about my tweet. It's all over the place. And he's like, yeah, it's bad. So that led to this whole thing where I was then kicked out of the locker room. Not really officially, like, man-to-man. Like, even if you were to tell me right now I was kicked out of the locker room, that would be more of, like, a, a genuine man-to-man situation where, like, okay, I can't. I never got that talk. I got this, like, automated email, like, through the work email, like, from the front desk saying, like, until further notice, I'm going to be uh, not allowed in the locker room. Blah, blah, blah. So the next day at work, I like, I tried it. And I was like, well, I'm just going to like act like I didn't see this email. So I go in the locker room. I draw my stuff. I go down and get my uh, hour of gym work and then two hours of ring training. And I go back up to shower. When I go up to, back up to shower, I go to the top of the stairs, right, which leads to the locker room. 
and I see all my stuff fanned out in the hall, and I'm like, no way. So I have this like, little like soft core altercation with everybody in the locker room. I get my stuff picked up for me, of course, and then from that moment moving forward, I was kicked out of the locker room. So at any venue that I would perform at, like whatever the main male locker room was, I would just assume that I'm not allowed in there because I'm not. So it, it became a very slippery slope of like, all right, like I'm doing this as my career, but odds are against me, coworkers are against me, and like I gotta start like prepping for the future. What's next, right? Right. So you kind of knew that this wasn't gonna work out in the long run. Yeah, um, it was like, and then it was like, all right, I'm not from this, and like this was a beautiful experience, but like the way it's going, I gotta start prepping for other things somehow. Yeah. Plus, mix a family into that too. So I'm a good dad. Like I'm a family man at heart. So. I want to like do what's best for the fam too. So, you know, we talked at the at the early stages of your athletics and everything. You mentioned basketball. You mentioned, of course, football. You're big into, but there was no like, was the WWE ever even part of your 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 you know vision or your dreams? You know, or was it that Instagram message that really kind of pulled that out? So I think Instagram allowed me to like display my like weirdness and my charisma and my and like person I am, like the Yeti side of me and market that without like, just, just as a natural thing, right? It wasn't like a game plan where I was like, all right, I gotta be this crazy guy and I gotta make this gimmick up so that someone will pick me up. It was just me just being myself and also being genuine to like, kind of like, uh, like an I don't care attitude mixed with like my comedy. And so I think that helped a lot along the way because of my size and like who I am, I had people like mention like, oh, you should go, you should be a wrestler or something. And I'm like, yeah, that'd, that'd be cool. But growing up, my, my only like, because I didn't have cable. I, didn't, I wasn't, like, watching WWE. I would go to my friend's house and play, like, Nintendo 64, and I would play, like, SummerSlam and, like, SmackDown video games on his Nintendo 64. And I'd always pick Stone Cold Steve Austin, or I'd pick The Rock, or, I'd like, he had, like, this downloadable content. I paid, I picked, like, Razor Ramon. He was, like, my, my favorite. So, like, that was, like, that was my premise of that. And it was, in, like, I never, like, thought negative about it, but it was never, like, my main thing. But... Right. The universe has guided me there. You feel me? Crazy. So then there you are, you know, you're 20, 26, 27, back in Colorado. The WWE is behind you and you're thinking, what's next? Yeah, I'm thinking what's next. I'm starting to feel like, not like this is a bad thing, but in, in comparison to the, the, my life so far, I'm starting to feel like the most civilian I've felt. You know, like I'm kind of like letting my athletic abilities not like slip, but dwindle. And I'm like gaining some weight. I'm kind of like going full American dad mode, you know what I mean? And like mm-hmm. there, there was a threaded silver lining within the, the tough enough experience. A week of the final four, we went to New York and we had like a week off to do like media. And there was a day where we went to this um, make a wish foundation event. And it was like actually a pretty like profound, like intense event for me. It kind of like solidified some perspective for me. I was basically in the room with like, a handful of like terminally ill kids that were all younger than like 11 and they loved the WWE. It was like John Cena and the Bella Twins were like the main ticket for them to feel good. And then it was like me, this cat named ZZ, this chick named Mandy Sachs, Sarah Lee. So it was like, it was the final four of the show. And so we're just making them laugh, having fun, eating uh, hors d'oeuvres with them, just like sharing stories, talking to their parents. Their parents are like happy too. It was like a cool event. At that event, I met this guy named Kirk Myers. And at the time, he had just started this gym. It's like a boat boutique, like bushy, nice gym called Dog Pound. And I met him at that event. He, he had noticed I lost a lot of weight. He's like a big guy. I'm losing weight. He himself had lost a lot of weight. Ran into him, and he's like, hey, man, I like what you're doing. I, like, I know you're going to win. I, uh, I respect heavily, like, how much weight you've lost on the show. Like, it's amazing. And, like, if you need to work out at all while you're in New York, like, come to my gym and work out, definitely. And I was like, yeah, bro. I was like, honestly, I, I need that. Like, I appreciate that a lot. Like, I'll come today if I can. And he's like, when do you think you come? I was like, probably, like, two hours. He's like, he's like, give me your location. I'll send you a car. You come work out. I'm like, definitely. Cool. So I can pull up to the gym, get a, get in there. It's like four VS Angels, Hugh Jackman prepping for Wolverine, and, like, a very cool environment that, like, I honestly hadn't really truly experienced yet uh, in, in a gym scene, right? It was very, like very nice and I was like well, this is nice so we started talking I'm like I'm being like a spark plug in there you know trying to reciprocate the love he's giving to me back to him so we have a couple good sessions and I, he's like yo I want you to come train with me the whole time you're in New York like it's no no charge like I got you and he's like well, so he's like, he's like are you certified 
to train? Do you have like, I'm like, oh yeah, I did this, this, and this. I do this online gimmick and I actually like um, have a degree in kinesiology, exercise science and sports nutrition. I was just going to say that that starts to pay off, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, wow, like what are the odds, right? So he's like, man, I wish I could hire you. I could, I, honestly, I could hire you. I could pay you X, Y, Z and like we could see like how to get you out of here. And I'm like, yo, like I, I appreciate that heavily and like it's something that I would like consider. But right now I got to like stay focused on this uh, tough enough situation. I'm probably going to win this and go do this. So like thanks, but like it's the timing's not right. He's like, yeah, I understand. So fast forward to I'm back in Colorado. I start training jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai heavy out of nowhere just to like get that like fire back in me, but also to like lose weight. Because I was getting to the point where I was going to the gym so much and I wasn't pushing myself to this like peak level. I was just kind of like going through the motions and it was good and I felt good and it was like above average, but I just needed that like competitive fire again somehow. So my buddy offered me to go do some jiu-jitsu. I did it. And mind you, at this point, when I came to terms with the WWE, like my Instagram went down. They took my Instagram away from me somehow for like two years. So like I'm totally off the grid and it felt nice. It was nice for my spirit, my mind and my body and everything. But I'm like completely dark as as like a social figure in terms of social media. So my Instagram has been gone for almost two years now, a year and a half. And I'm doing this Muay Thai training and this jiu-jitsu training and I'm starting to look good and like whatever. So my, my friends start filming a little bit and I'm like, man, I should like get, I should see if I can get that back. I reached out to a buddy who lost his Instagram. He told me his process and it was basically a process where I just like emailed Instagram like twice a day, this like copy paste that I put together saying I'm trying to get my Instagram back. And it was literally like a lottery. Like if you just email him once, you'll never hear back from him. But I emailed him like a plethora of times, finally they emailed me back followed with due process. I had to like hold my ID and like a number that they wrote to like prove it was me that they, they resurrect my Instagram. And and at this time when they took it from me, it was at a certain level. When I got it back, I had like 30 K followers. They, they deleted like 1300 pictures or something crazy. Cause I'd, I'd be posting I, anything from the end of my college career. And then all my WWE career, they, because of like likeliness or some sort of like a situational thing that was in my contract, it was gone. Oh, okay. I was like, I was like, this is crazy. So it was like, whatever. I got my Instagram back. So I'm putting some of this like me hitting mitts on there, whatever. And that was enough to like beacon the radar for like Kirk from Dog Pound to see me. So one day I'm just driving on the road in this work truck. It's like snowing. I'm like not having a good day, and I get this FaceTime from like a number I don't have saved. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, I, I was like, I'm gonna protect. I, I don't want no drama with nobody. I don't want any. I don't want. No one's thinking the wrong thing. I'm not even going to answer this, if you know what I'm saying. And so then I'm like, boom, they call me back again. And I'm like, whatever, I answer it. It's Kirk. He's like, hey, Yeti, how you doing? And I'm like, Shh. I'm, I mean, I show him the road. I'm like, it's, I'm driving in the snow, bro. I'm, I'm all right. How are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm great. I just got this huge investment. Some new investors were about to open up this location, a second location in West Hollywood in L.A. I, I consider you someone that I would want to be a head trainer and just really take this thing where I can't take it myself. And, and I'm going to help you take you where you can't take yourself, like, by doing this. And I was like, brother, what? I was like, I don't know. I'm out here making this much money. I was like, I don't, I was like, I'm pretty much, like, jaded and, like, paranoid right now in life. Like, I don't really want to, like, step away from what I got going. I had just, like, basically spent my goose egg, got this house to make sure that, like, I had, like, some legacy for my family. You know what I mean? And then I'm, now I'm just, like, working like a dog just to make mortgage payments and, like, live the life that I want to live. And so he's like, I could pay you this much money. We have the opening party, May 19th. And at this point, too, I had taken a fight. I was going to I was gonna have my first amateur fight May 19th. And so I'm like, dang, this is crazy. Like, I'm, I'm steadily approaching this, and I, like, have all these people, like, believing in me. Not all these people, but a nice handful of guys that, like, really helped rise me back up and, like, get me ready for this fight. I was like, all right, bro, I'll tell you what, I'm going to come out there and, like, check out what's going on right before the party, May 9th, and, like, see what's what and see if I could, like, find a place and, like, maybe you could help me find a place, and if that's the case, I'll do it. So he, like, sends over this contract, give me some money, and then uh, I go out there, and I'm like, bro, yeah, let's do this. So I just totally, like, flip-flop lane change and pull out of the fight, and then I move my whole family out there. At this point, I had about my son, too, when I got back from – so when, when I was in the WWE – me and my my ex at the time she was just my baby mama. We get we get back together. She gets pregnant with my son right before we come back to Colorado. So this is like a little like rewind real quick. So now I have two kids. 
and I have a baby mama, and I'm, like, trying to do the right thing. So, like, I get to L.A., I see the possibility, I see the opportunity, I dive in on both feet, like, I know how, and I'm doing instantly doing, like, there were some days I was doing 11 sessions a day, bro. I was doing, like, usually, like, seven to eight sessions a day, and that now, like, within two weeks, I'm training uh, Justin Bieber, Kelly Rowland, Adam Levine, like Ricky Martin, just to name a few. Like I'm, I'm training like nothing but sickos out the gate, and they're all loving me. I have this weird. Wow, these are big A list celebrities, man. Oh yeah, bro, it's incredible. So I'm like, I'm basically like, I have this weird. Like I, I'm me for one, and then for two, I have this look. They say, and then for three, I'm kind of this like C class celebrity that, that that I have like insight as what it is and feels like to go through what they go through, but at a lower level. And they could connect with that. I keep it real, bro. I keep it real genuine and like people like me. So now this momentum, they, they like training me. It's just going good. The gym's booming, bro. Like we got paparazzi outside all day. It's like money's good. Everything's good. But like well, usually when everything's good, something's like kind of not good, right? So for me at that time, it was just like my family. Like my daughter was happy, but like my relationship was struggling heavy because of just all this chaotic movement along with like mental toughness to be honest so that was another turmoil point where like now my family splits again and my baby mom decides to like take the kids to go home so now i get this rubik cube to like solve but i keep it pushing dog pound continues to grow i'm killing it now i'm starting to go to lo- both locations so i'm by coastal i'm going to new york to kind of like supplementally help come back it's like a good life and i'm doing like what i'm good at and like i could train you right right now we could go you and me could just Go outside and I give me like a mic. We have 20 people. I'll run a, I'll run a fitness course right now. We'll have a good time. You could, I, you could have your, your grandma pull up and she's like, oh, I don't know. I haven't worked out in 20 years. I'm like, baby, I got you. You know what I'm saying? I know how to, I know how to dial it down for everybody, bro. So like I can do that with my eyes closed. So now I'm basically doing that with my eyes closed until I get tired every day, all day. And uh, COVID happens. So boom, now we go through lockdown. Lockdown's crazy. We basically like funnel all the clients through like FaceTime sessions. Right. 30% of the people are staying staying with us, but like I'm, I'm waking up at nine o'clock to do a FaceTime session with someone that it's six o'clock in New York. And then next thing you know, I'm doing FaceTime sessions on the hour all day. And it's like almost, it's insane. We're still making our same money almost, but it's just this whole new ecosystem. And I have this, uh, my roommate, who's also like a head trainer at Dog Pound, which is kind of a crazy loophole, full circle story. He actually played at minnesota duluth who's who we played in the national championship in college so like i literally like was on the field with this guy never even knew him and then now that we get to dog pound we're like co-workers and best friends and roommates through lockdown so we're figuring out how to like organize this dog pound uh, scenario through covid once we started kind of opening up again it's like you can't be open you can't be open you can't be open you can't be open so we just decided to try to stay outside we move our gym into this like outdoor area of uh, a hotel called the Kimpton. So we're basically like training people like poolside now. So that we're outside, so it's open space. So there's no like risk of COVID. So we can stay open and make this money. We're doing that for mad long. Then there's like the heartbreaking moment where like this equity that was promised to uh, myself and like other head trainers uh, is like taken away from us and like there's this is equity in in dog pound the company basically a lot of like financial burden because of covid very understandable like we're just barely getting by rents crazy at the location we got xyz and um it gets to the point where it was all unbeknownst to us that we're losing this once it became clear and obvious there was also a whole lot of other schematic and um and like lines of respect that were like faded away I got to a point where I had had enough once again. And I'm like, all right, like this is a time for me to where like, I feel like my values being compromised. The promises I was given are compromised, but I'm still in this geographical location and I'm set up to win. I like, I know how to win. I'm basically going to win and I'm going to leave and start no cap fitness. Cause like one of my taglines in life since college is like no cap. A lot of people say, what does no cap mean? Okay. You can throw it on like any sentence, like it almost like it's an apostrophe, but you could also like say in an inspirational way, like to affirm someone's doing well, right? Like no cap means like no salary cap, no limit, no sky, there's no cap. So it just means like, it's just a positive affirmation of mine. That is like 
widely used in society today anyway but like i really like stamp that down because like that's how i'd be trying to live my life no cap baby so i start no cap fitness and i don't really know how i'm gonna do it but i'm gonna do it and i get i get blessed with this space that's like so incredibly close to dog pound start paying rent there start having clients come and i'm just turning over clients just doing all doing what i know how to do grind that goes good for a while i'm training my, my buddy jeremy piven he's one of my good friends he's helping me support me a lot some of my older friends are like coming out of the woodwork trying to help me and support me. I started this uh, company called Root Strength with my friend Rodman. He's, uh, he's a good friend of mine. He's like someone that I found out there and like helped him a couple times. He helped me a couple times. We had this like brain wave to start this coffee replacement that's like mushroom based. It's got like lion's mane, reishi, cordyceps, adaptogens in it. It's got very minimal trace amounts of caffeine. A lot of the consumers are using it to wean off a of coffee and it's like there's no crash to it so we get that thing going i have all these like little so i'm just basically becoming a farmer bro i'm like planting seeds non-stop until it's time to harvest them and if i don't keep planting them then like there's not going to be anything to harvest right so i get in this crazy uh loophole of training and i start seeing opportunities to uh, launch the brand root strength so we launch it the october 2nd of this last year and we decided to do that in columbia i went out to columbia for like nine days to launch it and like why columbia because uh one of our manufacturer guys has some family out there and it just made sense geographically and it was a way to kind of celebrate i guess okay we do that i end up staying i haven't fallen in love with columbia i stay there much longer than nine days i'm just like using my network and kind of switching lanes becoming this person that is just like trying to use all my vast amount of networking and connections to like plug and play and make opportunity for me and my people and try to make this cohesive family with all the madness that has ensued then i get back to colorado for the holidays important to me christmas is important to me i'm here for my kids no matter what and then my birthday's in january my daughter's birthday is also in january so it's a nice like gridlock two months with that being said as i get out here i start like running into all my friends and family uh, uh, that i was fighting with and I start training hellaciously and I'm feeling good. I'm like probably like the most functionally athletic developed maturity I've been like to, if I'm honest with myself. So I'm like training like crazy. I'm training all week. I'm training at Gen Genesis with coach Jaker. I'm training my boy, uh, Zach McChesney sometimes out of his ranch. And I'm, uh, I'm doing most of my jujitsu work at three or three training facility with Tony. And I'm just like, just getting lost in it. Kind of just forgetting what's going on type type situation. I get an opportunity to fight, and someone accepts the fight, and then they pull out, and then this is an amateur fight, right? This is this would be your first amateur fight. Yeah, yeah, this is my first amateur fight. My friend from the WWE hits me up. He stayed in the WWE longer than I did, and we went through a lot of stuff together. And he's like a guy that like I really trust and was like a good friend to me. He puts me in touch with this idea of a guy who's in a similar situation as me out there, and. Um, so I kind of plant some seeds, talk to my coaches, talk to the promotion that I'm trying to work with, which is actually like a bogus promotion in terms of like comparison to other promotions, which is like Sparta. It just is what it is. They end up all getting in touch and triangulate this guy into my quarters and we end up booking the fight, bro. So now all of a sudden I'm getting ready for this fight and I'm more than ready. I like, I get down, I'm like around 255, 256, pretty much statically for uh, for the fight. Like I was just training like a madman. I get ready for the fight. We had the fight, I lost the fight, bro. Uh, it was it was like a quick battle of like two horses. I had him against the cage. I'm standing up and he's got me wrenched up. And then I have my hands on the cage and the ref's tearing my hands away because he's saying I'm grabbing the cage. And in a moment of like readjustment, he like cinches down the choke like immensely. And I know it's pretty much over. So now I'm thinking I got to like create separation. I'm going to try to torque this guy down to the ground or something to try anything I could do. And as that was happening, I, I pass out. I didn't tap. And then we collapse on me. Boom, I wake up. It's over. Uh, I mean, that's how it went, bro. It's just it's the name of the game. So luckily for me. I mean, I took it hard in terms of, like, I wanted that bad. You know what I mean? I grinded my ass off for a long time for that. Uh, I, I continue to. I still will. But it was just a situation where it was like, all right, like, this hurts. It sucks. But, like, shh, in terms of my career, I've been here before, bro. Like, that was fun still. And, like, it was this wasn't, like, someone else 
made me lose this is like that's why that's one of the beautiful things and, and the beauty I see in the sport is like it's really like the first sport besides WWE where I was like it's all on me and it's like even though it didn't turn out how I wanted it to turn out like who can I blame like how, how can you really get that mad uh, in terms of like moving forward like it's not like it's over and it's also a situation where at my level and like at my size you're getting a fight with someone that's like if it's a real fight that's like worth like watching it's gonna be a turbulent war quick you know what i'm saying so uh it was it was a good experience it was crazy experience a lot of people have told me since then it was like maybe like uh, a situation where i should have been more thought out and maybe like i i, I need to like have more of like a, a team behind me and because of that talk there's this guy named art uh, his Instagram is like R three hundred three MMA. He's a sick, sick fighter. He's a, he's a stone cold killer, and he's actually uh, kind of stepping into this new position with Genesis Fight Camp to manage guys. And so, like moving forward, I'm gonna be working with him, and he's gonna be like really like put me in position to where it's like this next fight I take. I'm not looking for no hand me out fight, but I'm definitely learning to like build my career and like have like a, a good good experiences in the cage to where I can learn from. Because just like any other sport, once you get to that next level. Whether it's like from high, middle school to high school, or from high school to college, or from college to the pros, like the speed goes up. There's like uncomfortability within the moments, and you start feeling like you just notice like this is like unfamiliar. So with that experience I had, the unfamiliarity of it, like moving forward, I have that experience now, and it's only going to behoove me in the rest of my uh, career. So that kind of brings us to the current day, bro. And I'm just, I'm just here blessed, uh, working with millions, you know what I'm saying? I'm working with a lot of projects around. I just, I just got back from California. Me and my friend, uh, Charles with wealth garden entertainment. We had this like beautiful Juneteenth event, raised some money for this uh, black excellence scholarship. There's just been a lot of like positive bro. So I'm just trying to stay in the light, keep my light shining and like use my physical abilities along with like my mental abilities to like win and like prosper. Well, that, that's awesome, man. And uh, really, you know, happy to hear that, uh, you know, you had a successful Juneteenth uh, charity event. That's pretty awesome. I saw that on your Instagram. Yeah, it was dope. And um, there's something else, actually, that I, I want to share with the, with the audience. What, what is it? I'm just a one one We like beauty and the beast. Ain't no imagine us. I'm like an animal when we get up in the sheets. So I make it come. I beat it up, beat it up, beat it up, beat it up. Like yeah. Drum. Oh, I'm loading. Push up on that thing and I explode it. Yeah, yeah, that's a little something. You know All what right, I mean? So, so let's let's talk about this. You got you got some music going on. You're a musician as well, a recording artist. Yeah, bro, I am. I mean, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to prove myself to get into a situation where I can turn that over too. But I have a lot of fun, and I have like a true love. I feel like kind of like in a relatable sports analogy would be like I, I feel like I'm in the zone like I do on the field like when I'm in the studio and I'm like in that moment where I'm like killing it and it's just flowing out of me when, when did you start you know sort of gravitating towards making music uh I started making music like in in, in high school you know what I mean I was like oh can you freestyle and it's like you're like nervous to freestyle or whatever and like some people don't even have a clue why or what, what they're doing it for and some people just like have a niche for it so me me and some of my friends at my high school would be freestyling a lot and then when i got to college i had there was like this mic that came out it's called the yeti mic so i copped it yeah. and then me and my friend paul browning started we were both injured so we started making these like kind of like parody songs we were, we were basically like take an instrumental and like match the cadence of whatever artist had a song on that and we would just change the lyrics I wasn't trying to practice, but it was a nice way to practice how to deliver. And like, uh, we made some songs like in reference to like our, our team and just like a bunch of like a plethora of songs. Some of them are on the song cloud, some of them are like forevermore uh, exclusively not gonna be heard. <laughs> and like some of them, like I'll be feeling them and like I could tell my friends were really feeling them and some of them I wouldn't really be feeling, my friends were feeling them. So it was just one of those things where it was like, you just gotta keep throwing it bro and like it'll work out. And then I think like now I've been practicing that technically for like four years, like pretty like consistently. I'll make like two songs a week at least at night or like whenever. Right right now my current like musical situation, there's a this house band called like That's Hot Music. That's Hot Music. And it's like Maddie Ghost and Parmesan. It's my two boys. They're killing it. That we're gonna actually make a song pretty soon. So it's gonna be more of like it's gonna be a house track, but like I'm gonna be the vocals on it. 
they have a new studio at their basement they're going to be messing with. So, And then I have this uh, friend that I played at high school football with. He's gone through his career. He's got a studio locally. I'm about to go link with him too. So it's definitely something I'm pursuing. It's definitely also something I know like that I got to keep continue to get better at, but I'm pretty confident in like what I can throw down. So we'll see how that works out, bro. You know, recording artist and a mixed martial artist right now. eh? pretty, pretty impressive, man. Artiste, bro. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, on, on top of all that, now you're also on the millions platform. Yes. Uh, you're doing ask me anything. That's right. You're going to be launching uh, your own line of branded merch, right? Yes. Right. So I'm with millions now. I'm proud to be with millions. Uh, like you said, I'm going to be doing my own, ask me videos so you can just hit me up on the link in my bio you'll be able to uh, request a video happy birthdays hellos uh, any like retro thing like i'll make you a song really whatever i have some merch coming up too i got the design team working on some like no cap situations for me i got like a yeti hood like what's happening with me shirt coming out just some things that like have been kind of like staples uh catchphrase type staples within my career that i think like my fans and like my people that are tuned in are are in tune with and they'll be able to like start supporting me through that and then uh, i hope to just i'm hoping to put out the most fire merch on millions i i guarantee you man our design team is dope they're gonna pump out some awesome stuff for you man you're gonna love it yeah guarantee i can't wait bro the other thing too that uh, that we got to get you doing is hosting a watch party at some point yeah and you you know you could do a watch party for wwe you could do a watch party for an mma event yeah. you know uh, uh whatever you want kind of thing even football or college football if you wanted to i'm, I'm down to do monday night raw SummerSlam. I'm, I'm down to do i think i think wrestling will be the most fun for me to do a watch party but then i'm down across the board i'll, I'll do a watch party with well, let's do some olympic some olympic swimming <laughs> you're down for whatever right whatever you want i love it man well uh yeah we're really excited to have you on the platform i think you're gonna have a lot of fun once you do start hosting watch parties and uh you're gonna love your uh merch when it comes out really appreciate having you on the show oh, i appreciate you shout out millions i'll see you guys in the live cast i'll see you guys on the next podcast no cap thanks for joining me bro thank you for joining me in the front row seat with joshua yeti bradle Once again, I'm your host, Shane Mercer, and this podcast is presented by Millions.co. If you want to support and interact with Josh, visit Millions.co to ask him anything, shop his merch, and join him for exclusive live events. You can also find Front Row Seat on Millions to shop our merchandise. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on YouTube and follow us on all the socials at frontrow.pod. We'll see you next week with our next special guest as we dive deep and give you the Front Row Seat. Run, 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 see.